again, the simplicity of it all. And here we get to the good stuff to see how the estate documents, the will and the trust agreement were manipulated and brought before Pinellas County judges. There was an original will that was signed on August 9th, 2000. Okay, and then there was a trust agreement that was signed on August 29th, 1991. That was nine years earlier than the will. And both documents were filed in probate court on June 24th, 2013. So two years after my mother's death were they filed with the court. And so let's get into the will where it was expressly stated that my mother being of sound and disposing mind and memory, do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament. So upon the death of my husband, or if he predeceases me, and he had, he had died before my mother, my trustees shall distribute the entire estate to my daughters, Maria and Irene, share and share alike. If either of my daughters predecease me or dies during the term of this trust, her share shall go to her descendants. I constitute and appoint my daughters, Maria George and Irene Hughes, as trustees or co-trustees. So, and here you have two girls. They are both to receive equal portions of the estate and deemed to be trustees, co-trustees. So Maria and Irene were co-trustees of the trust. I not make, nominate, and appoint my husband to be personal representative. So in the event he doesn't survive, which he didn't, then Maria and Irene would be personal representatives. So here you have Maria and Irene were both trustees and personal representatives and were to share the estate 50-50. It was very simple. That was the original will. Suddenly, though, there was a second version of the will that appeared on the scene dated Christmas Eve 2006. Isn't that interesting? Another holiday here. Both the original and the supposedly second will were filed in the probate court on the same day uh, in June 2013, well after uh, my parents were deceased. My mom was taken to the Alzheimer's facility in June of 2005, and it says the document was dated a year and a half later and after my mother in the facility and eight years from her admission to the facility. So where it says that she was being of sound and disposing mind and memory, do hereby make, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament. Well, unfortunately, my mom was isolated and monitored 24 seven. And both my parents spent their last days basically imprisoned and bedridden. So this was a pour over device for the items um, not provided for in, in the trust. They also added a third amendment to the will. And you will see that this is a bogus will <laughs> with a bogus third amendment. But the entire trust estate in this bogus will that all of a sudden just showed up, it says the entire trust estate to my daughter Irene and my grandson Peter to share and share alike. So everything that my parents had put in my name now had Peter's name on them. And so he was born in 1982. So it's impossible that my parents would have allowed Peter to inherit any portion of their estate, not even a dime, actually. Uh, but I do think my father would have been fair. But uh, with the stipulation that, that Peter you know, change some of his ways because the entire family knew that Peter was a partier and he drank too much, he partied too hard, and uh, that's all I'm going to say on that one. But my parents didn't tolerate that and they certainly were not going to fund that, that's for sure. And so, and of all the grandchildren, Peter was actually the least favored, although my mother and Peter kind of had a special relationship uh, because they were both sarcastic, they had good senses of humor, and so they, they used to laugh a lot together, so that was cute. My my father really didn't care for Peter because he um, had a very arrogant lifestyle, you know, and he, an exorbitant lifestyle and um, kind of a, an arrogant attitude and entitled, actually, and so, uh, and also with his association with Scott and Irene, 
who's uh, stalking and monitoring and threats unnerved my parents to no end. So my parents didn't even want Peter visiting them. And so for him to be inheriting tens of millions of dollars wasn't even believable. And, uh, and plus he was, okay, so if he was the supposed heir, he didn't come to the hospital, at least not to my knowledge. And um, once he came to visit my mom, actually when he came to visit me, I said, let's go visit Yaya in the, um, in the Alzheimer's facility. And so we went together. To my knowledge, he did not uh, ever go at any other time, and he didn't go to the hospital. But again, you know, for six weeks, my father was hidden from me, so I don't know who was in and out of that room. But um, certainly at the funerals, I didn't see him at either funeral, and he didn't come to pay his respects to his grandparents that had, you know, supposedly suddenly made him, you know, a very, very wealthy man. But um, Peter had uh, turned ice cold, and although in the past he had had full access to my homes and, and cars and everything, beginning in 2008 or 2009 when he'd come for a weekend visit, he was on a mission to sabotage me, and it was it was very clear. Um, he would stage things, and he would tell me things that weren't weren't true, and um, he liked to criticize and belittle me, I guess. And so he was spending hours on my computer, kind of hacking and copying, or at least that's what I saw, and uh, manipulating and sharing personal information with with Scott and Irene, um, who were both. I saw them to be stealing from me. So the last time I saw Peter was during his deposition and uh, as his dad's witness in the bankruptcy trial, which I already spoke about. But uh, he had flown in from London to Chicago for a video conference. And when I saw Peter's face, I was so happy, you know. And But then he insisted, actually out of nowhere, to, that the camera be moved to not see my face while he's talking into it. Once my uh, attorney began asking him questions, <laughs> I understood why. And it was because the bankruptcy judge said that the $10 million would be erased if I wrote the letter because I was afraid. We had the testimony of what he told the divorce judge. So it was really a slam dunk. But, um, but in fact, Peter ruined it. Peter did not tell the truth. And so... I ended up losing everything because of that. And so that's what happened to Peter. And I have not heard from Peter since um, since I called him and asked if I could give him my condo as long as I could live there. And he uh, refused. He said, call my attorney and leave me alone. So I thought, okay. So it's a tough lesson to experience your own family being so vengeful. Obviously, if they were struggling, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't expect them to do much for me. However, they're they're swimming, they're swimming in um, gems and jewels and gold and and funds and trusts and and accounts and investments and real estate and uh, everything else, and uh, and they've just taken everything. And and you wonder. It was, it was really an interesting lesson. It was an interesting experience, but to see that people will, um, that people are, are just so heartless, and I think that uh, sometimes we have to see that because we need to see that we are on different paths, and um, maybe Peter wasn't supposed to be part of my life going forward because he thought of life in an entirely different way. Would have been nice, you know, had we been able to talk about it together and share those moments, a mother and son, mother and children. But in fact, if if someone is going to um, treat another human being, I mean, I'm sure he treats strangers better than he's treated his mother. And so for him to want to do that, then I think better that he not be on my path, better that he um, find his own way because these are karmic lessons that he's learning. It would be more painful, I think, for both of us if we, you know, just totally disagreed all the time. So it's just better that he live his life, as difficult as that is for a Greek mother to even say. But um, it's, 
it is the way it is. So I did mention that uh, in the bogus version of the will, the trustee distributes a thousand dollars to me and my uh, my daughter and my two sons, and that's that's it. In that will, Irene is listed as trustee. And if she's unable, her husband, who uh, Willard, actually his name his middle name is Alan, and he goes by Alan. So Alan and Tom, our cousin, were co-trustees, and that was because my father wanted the scales balanced. He wanted 50% uh, to Maria, 50% to Irene, and then Irene's husband would back her up if she couldn't, uh, for some reason, function. And then Tom, who was more supportive of me, right, he would be put in place there. So th they were the backups. But Irene and I were still co-trustees. And so with equal power and control, but Maria wasn't listed anywhere in that. And the same thing is true with uh, the personal representative, right? So the personal representative was Irene and then uh, Alan and Tom or co-personal reps. And they were the backup in case Irene couldn't function. So here again, you wonder who appointed Irene as trustee and a personal rep, if my mother was not of sound mind and memory? Who and who removed me as trustee? Because in both my mother and father's wills, both of us were trustees and even successor trustees and personal reps. So the answer is that Irene in the bogus third amendment, she wrote, he wrote, attorneys wrote, I don't know who wrote. All I know is um, I don't believe that it's it's real. In fact, I know it's not real because that's just not the way my father had ever, ever stated that it was going to happen that way. Irene wrote that she was able to take on the identity really of my mother and put in place whomever she wanted. So here you have one daughter who basically can rewrite the trust and did rewrite the will and did. And so there was a, a false copy of the trust and a false copy of the will. And uh, I was taken out of both. And um, Irene and Peter shared the whole thing. So lo and behold, I was going to come to Clearwater to kind of see what was going on with the in the, uh, the courthouse so that I could read some of the documentation. Lo and behold, Tom, the um, our attorney cousin, who was going to be my backup, he mysteriously died in 2021, around the time that I was beginning to expose some of the crimes in my uh, Forgiveness to Love videos. And I was planning a trip here to meet with him. And actually, when I arrived here this time, I drove to his law office and was shocked to learn that he had died because he was in his mid-50s. He couldn't stand up to tell the truth that this document was bogus because he was no longer here. And so, again, this document was drafted on Christmas Eve and another clue as far as I'm concerned. So the third amendment that was added to the last will and testament was dated on Christmas Eve. 2006. And so here you have the uh, the entire trust estate to my daughter Irene and my grandson Peter. My daughter Irene is the trustee. And if she can't act, her husband Alan and Tom are co-trustees. So I guess Tom was supposed to support uh, Peter. Although he wasn't a trustee, Peter was uh, just a beneficiary. He was to inherit half of the estate. So Irene was appointed personal rep of the last will and testament. And uh, then Alan and Tom were co-personal reps. And so that's just so ridiculous because <laughs> um, that's what Irene and I were. So she just decided that uh, she could just rewrite anything she wanted. And she's the one that wrote that she could rewrite anything she wanted because she acted as my mother and she changed the documents. This is how some of this 
stuff is done. And it's, it's shocking, really, isn't it? The duties of the trustee. Their duty is to distribute the trust income and or principal to the beneficiaries, right? To keep records of all the trust transactions and to issue statements of account and tax reports, right? And to the trust beneficiaries and to answer any questions that the beneficiaries may have concerning the trust. And I had lots of questions, but no one answered any of them. In fact, no one would even return my call, answer my email, answer messenger, answer the door, nothing. And uh, the same goes for their attorney who acted as if I didn't exist. So since there was no communication from my co-trustee and the gang stalking escalated through the brook, I felt totally powerless. I just felt like, who was I going to ask for help when not one attorney would take my case, right? And so here you have a trustee has a fiduciary duty to, to manage the trust assets, to facilitate the distribution, so we know that a trustee has a responsibility to manage the assets and to distribute the trust assets. And as far as I'm concerned, Irina's trustee has totally failed uh, because in my mind, she was stealing anything and everything of mine that she could get her hands on. And so uh, she was to keep records of all transactions and yet she never filed an accounting. There was no inventory of trust assets. And she never made herself available to answer any questions of the beneficiaries might have had concerning the trust. So uh, one of the things that a trustee must do is they must put a beneficiary first. And you cannot take advantage of the authority vested in a trustee if the family is a trustee. I did read that it's, it's as if there's a ticking time bomb because the trustee can be influenced by family or by their own self-interest. And that's exactly what was going on here. And she refused to answer my calls and letters and contact, um, any attempts to contact her. And I even went to her husband's medical clinic. And uh, uh, he closed the door on me. I went to the, the medical clinic and then I also went to their home and he answered the door. And when I saw him, I hadn't seen him in years, and I was I was quite happy to see him, actually. But he opened the door, and then he, like, shut the door, and that was it. And uh, there were cars in the driveway and things like that, and so I'm sure she was there, and probably they were, they probably knew I was coming because I hear they stalk me on my phone. So, um, yeah, so they knew I was there, and so he opened the door and closed the door, and that was it. And so anyway, I, when I went to his office, I did uh, ask for um, a message to be given to him so that he could give it to my sister to call me so we could discuss this. And yet, uh, I never heard back from anyone. As I said, I even contacted their her attorney, and he didn't uh, contact me or in any way, shape, or form. But what do they say? The guilty hide, right? kind of like you turn on the light and the cockroaches just kind of scatter but in the dark that's when they come out and so I did read that it says the fiduciary duty of a trustee it's the most basic duty of a trustee is the duty of loyalty which obligates the trustee to put the interests of the beneficiaries first ahead of their own self-interest and to refrain from exploiting the relationship for the trustee's personal benefit. So there you have it. I'll go through that again. The most basic duty of a trustee is the duty of loyalty, which obligates the trustee to put the interests of the beneficiaries first. So above all else, Irene had to put the interests of all the beneficiaries first. Well, <laughs> Yes. Where was my interest? Um, she had a duty of loyalty to put my interest above her own. And how did I all of a sudden get deleted from these documents that she wrote? She had to refrain from exploiting the relationship that she had for her personal benefit and self-interest. <laughs> and so she violated virtually every aspect of her duty 
And as a trustee to me, she certainly put her self-interest above each and every beneficiary that I'm aware of. And let me tell you about the condos. A most flagrant example is that Irene put my parents' condo in default by not paying some bills. I don't know what bills those were that weren't paid, but that condo went into default. And that was totally contrary to her promise to our dad that she would make sure all bills were paid for both condos. That money was in the corpus of the trust. So it wasn't like she had to go find it somewhere else. It was part of the trust. And she gave number 417, my home, to Peter. And she and Tim, her attorney, swore that no one else had a right to 417. They swore on a document. So go figure. Then they filed a motion saying that, in fact, she and I were tenants in common of 414, that we both owned 414. And I don't know if that had to do with the fact that they really couldn't legally take my only home in Florida. They said that we were tenants in common and that I owned half of, of my parents' condo. However, they also said that I owed my ex-husband for the defamation judgment. And so what they did is apparently Irene stopped paying for my parents' condo. So it went to the sheriff and the sheriff auctioned it off. And my ex-husband, Scott, bought my parents' condo for quite possibly $100 for the filing fee because I could not find a purchase price for that. So he bought my parents' condo at an auction that he and Irene had allowed to go into default. He bought it for nothing. And then six months later or whatever, he sold it for several hundred thousand dollars. And I didn't get anything because even though I was supposedly, but I really wasn't, um, supposedly a tenant in common, they only did that so that Scott could get some money out of it. And it's just, it was so ridiculous. Now, if we talk about the trust agreement of my parents, my mother writes that um, upon the death of my husband, or if he predeceases me, my trustee shall distribute the entire trust estate to my daughters, Maria and Irene, share and share alike, so they get 50-50. And if either of the daughters should die, then it goes straight to their heirs. So it's not like one daughter would end up getting everything then. Uh, it would go to the heirs. And there was, um, we were also successor trustees too. So if for any good reason, Bessie shall cease to act as trustee, then I appoint Maria and Irene as successor trustees. So we were both successor trustees. So the next thing was the spendthrift provision. And that's that the interest of beneficiaries uh, shall not be subject to the claims of creditors. So the uh, trust could not be used to settle a debt. And so none of the trust, nothing to do with the trust could go to Scott in terms of uh, to paying off the $10 million defamation judgment, right? Because the spendthrift clause prohibits that. The trust is not subject to the claims of creditors. Basically, the trust is that Maria and Irene share and share alike, 50-50 beneficiaries. Maria and Irene are successor trustees. And there's the spendthrift provision prohibiting Scott from touching a dollar of the inheritance. Now, in the trust, the first amendment, there was a first amendment, and this is when the trust was first devised. The estate was to be divided 50-50 to Maria and Irene, and that my children were not to receive an inheritance until they were 25 years old, because my father didn't want Scott 
to be meddling in with uh, the inheritance, right? So then there was the second amendment to the trust, and that was done in December of 2005, one and a half years after my father had bought 417. And what he specifically said is that 417 goes to Maria and 414 goes to Irene. And the address on both condos had an incorrect zip. So anytime somebody would mail something, I wouldn't get it. So the mail didn't reach the intended recipient. Is that what they're going to say? Is that why the condo went into default and there was a sheriff sale? It sounds like an alibi to me. Everybody knew that uh, that condo did not go to this zip. I think it was 33708 or something like that, but that's not the, the zip of the condo. And so there was a wrong zip and 414 goes to Irene. And then there was a wrong zip and 417 goes to Maria. So neither one of us supposedly got any mail. My father had an IRA that, was, that he had said I was the sole beneficiary of, and it was in a Merrill Lynch account. And he had told his broker that no matter what, before anything gets divided, Maria gets my mother's IRA that was much larger than my father's. That never happened. <laughs> I was in Arizona. That was where the broker ended up moving from Chicago. And I actually went to that office. I was invited there and mentioned that there is um, an account, that there's an IRA there that I'm entitled to, that I'm the sole beneficiary of. People there looked it up and they said, yes, you need to have these documents subpoenaed. There is some question here. They said, but you have to have an open lawsuit. And again, you know, when I said in Florida, I couldn't get, for some reason, attorneys were not allowed to help me. So I, and they said it has to be a Florida attorney. So again, it was like this huge conspiracy because I couldn't even get an attorney to send a subpoena so I could get the documents. It was just ridiculous, isn't it? We have about the 414 going to my sister and 417 going to me and the wrong zips. And even mine had a wrong address because it was on Gulf Boulevard. And this one said that it was on Gulf Road. And I think there is a Gulf Road. So there was no mail was supposed to come to me, apparently. The trust was to pay the bills. So there were to be no outstanding bills for either one of those condos because there was certainly enough money in the trust that every month all the bills would be paid for those two condos. And so my mother and father said Maria and Irene were to get uh, equal shares. And then they even said that because my parents really liked some of their crystal and some of their, their sterling silver pieces and, and, and art, my father did have some beautiful paintings and all of those were to be split 50-50. And yet a third amendment that was attached to the will and the trust. And, and what that said is that it basically contradicts virtually everything that was in the second amendment. And it even said that they couldn't find the second amendment to add it. So they just added the third amendment. <laughs> I have a copy of the second amendment. And it was in the court files unless somebody's removed it, in 2013, they said that they just couldn't find that Second Amendment, which is very weird. Again, in this, it said that Irene was to be the trustee and that uh, Peter was to get my home and all the furniture and everything in it. My mother appointed Irene as attorney in fact, Alan, attorney in fact, along with Tom. Everything was the same, except that my name was uh, omitted and Peter's name was put in. So they just took everything. So one of the things that's very interesting is that Irene was saying that she actually created this document because our mom was not of sound mind and memory. So this document deleted me and my titles uh, as trustee, as co-trustee, as successor trustee, as attorney in fact, um, as personal representative, Irene gave the entire estate to herself and Peter. Now, why was there a wrong zip, right? And uh, 
a wrong street so that I would never receive any any mail about any of this so that no mail could arrive and the manipulations were could be hidden there were a lot of finagling things because the condos were to be given to the uh, beneficiaries free and clear both condos were not to have any debts at all they were never to be sold in a share of sale because I had things in 414. Remember one of the things was that I keep some of my things in my father's spare bedroom, and I did. I had a lot of beautiful antique things in there that I had boxed up and um, put in luggage and things like that because my father had told me that uh, Irene and Scott were coming into my condo. So my father said, just bring it in my condo, and I did. And yet, all of a sudden, um, I guess she emptied what she wanted and then gave it all to the sheriff and then he sold it to Scott for a hundred dollars so then Scott got it all so Scott got all the things that I was that my father wanted me to hide in his condo to protect it from Scott and so this way Scott kind of wormed his way in through Irene claiming that he took my half of my parents condo as he became the tenant in common and then bought the condo that was auctioned for like nothing and then sold it like six months later for several hundred thousand dollars. That's really, really kind of interesting, isn't it? And you really see what people are made of and you really see to what extent they will go in order to thieve. It's, sh it's shocking and yet at the same time, it's not shocking because we know that people, some people, will do just about anything for money. And that's that's very sad because what did they say? Some people are so sad that all they have is money or something. Uh, and it's, it's true. And then what was really weird is that in 2015, there was a summons put out for me. Oh, Irene sued Peter and me individually and as the nominated successor co-trustee. So this is weird because Irene and Peter were working together. So why would Irene sue Peter and me as if we were t working together? And that's just simply not not true because he, my son had thrown me away years before. So I wondered, what was this litigation really about? And something was being hidden at that point and I, I had to start digging. Um, I realized that this that there was a summons issued on May 12th, which was like the day after or two days after Mother's Day. And so that's a narcissistic thing, right? They were letting me know that, yeah, that's a fake too. It was five years after my father had died and Irene decided to sue Peter and me together. And so why did they wait that long? And, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, it's because they tried to get rid of me so many other times. But, um, but I, I don't remember ever being served this summons. And in fact, they said what was so weird is that all the sheriffs in California got a copy of the summons. So if they saw me, they could serve me. And then I was to know about this lawsuit, right? But because by this time, I wasn't even living anywhere near that. I was living with, with friends. So they didn't really try to reach me, right? Because if they had since they were following me and monitoring me 24 seven, they would know exactly how to give me that summons. So they wanted to have this summons, but they didn't really want me to get it. Plus I was broken in survival mode and I couldn't deal with any of this anyway. I wasn't gonna be able to fly back to Florida for another walk in the park. They were trying to determine the validity of the third amendment because it was so blatant and on its face unlawful and dishonest and so what they wanted to do is they went before a judge and they wanted the judge to stamp it and say oh yes oh yes this is valid and so if I had my chance I would be able to say this is a bunch of of BS uh, postmarked on May 22nd which was the day after my mother died and the day after uh, Stephen's birthday I don't know if it was if the reason, the 22nd, maybe they filed it on the 21st. Uh, that's when there was a check of $1,000 in the mail and they wanted me to sign something saying I would never sue. So I didn't sign anything. 
That's what that was about. They really wanted to make sure that the Third Amendment was not going to be scrutinized because it clearly, it, it would have been and should be. It was in the presence of two witnesses, and one of them was a, a cousin of my mother's, and her name is, is spelled wrong. Her name was Mary Halkis, H-A-L-K-I-A-S, and here it's her name is Maria Halkis, H-A-L-K-I-S, and as if Irene doesn't know uh, how to spell the name of our cousin, she was one of the witnesses to the Third Amendment. I don't know if I believe any of this. In fact, I don't. But, uh, oh, and then in the Third Amendment that I, that I was sent, they had the, ch the names of the children that were to get $1,000. So there's Irene and Peter, and they were getting 50% of the, of the estate. And then Maria and her three children were getting $1,000 each. And so my third son, his name is Stephen Charles. So they wrote his name as Stephen Charges. <laughs> so uh, somebody doesn't even know how to spell charges. Um, Charles, I mean. <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous. So you've got all of these things that are just so blatantly wrong. But if you interview 30 or 40 attorneys and no one will take your case, you know, what are you going to be doing? Making videos, <laughs> I guess. Then Irene asked the clerk of the court to enter a default judgment because I didn't answer the complaint because they didn't want uh, to reach me anyway. They actually listed me as uh, a nominated successor co-trustee. And so they I don't know if they were, I suppose they were going to give that title to me. But then because they didn't want any of the information see, to um, reach me, they were never going to give it to me anyway. So, and then Irene, when I didn't respond, because I never got it, um, when I didn't respond, um then Irene asked the clerk to put in a default judgment. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, I lost. That was, that was that. And then I guess they, there was a hearing in uh, Judge Linda Allen's chambers, Linda Allen, um, in her chambers in the Pinellas County Courthouse. She found I was properly served because the clerk said I was properly served and that a default judgment was entered against me. And what the court found is that the trust doesn't expressly say that someone can't have all those titles. So Irene had every title in the book that she could come up with. And uh, that obviously is blatantly unlawful, but they said that the trust doesn't say that you can't do that. I mean, it doesn't say you can either, but uh, why would they just say you can't do something that, that most people would have never even imagined doing, right? And uh, attorney, in fact, the alternate attorney, in fact, successor trustee, and uh, we were both all of those. I'm going to connect with you again in the next one. Thank you.